Sky's Wide Awake Stories. Thank you for coming by, Mike. Mike is a longtime photographer in the L.A. rave scene. He's been shooting, God, I don't even know how long. I've I've known you for about 15, 6, no, 20, almost probably 20 years now. Getting close to 20, yeah. I mean, I've been shooting at a little more than 20 years. I started in the clubs in Hollywood in like 93 and 94 and graduated to the rave scene in 96. Pretty much didn't uh, look back after that. Back in those days, I was writing and photographing for all the major dance music magazines, though. It was a really, really heady period. It was a amazing era and a very important era in American pop culture. I liken it to the beginning of the jazz age in the 30s, where you could also draw parallels to the uh, rise of punk or hip-hop. I mean, they all shared certain elements, you know, with the whole rave thing, especially the whole do-it-yourself mentality, which was born, of course, mostly out of necessity in those days. Which leads us perfectly into what you're working on right now is it's called the Raver Stories Project. And what it is, it is a collection of stories about uh, people's most amazing, memorable, or transformative moments, you know, in the rave scene as written by ravers themselves. Well, it's mostly ravers. It's uh, ravers and some promoters and some DJs. But basically, it's being put together to give, you know, people a voice as to why this whole rave thing is so important to them, why it touches something deep inside them, why they keep coming back to it again and again. What happened was, I, late last year, I put out a call to action from the electronic uh, music community asking for their, you know, their best stories. And the response I got was fantastic. I mean, I got stuff from all over the world, from England, from Argentina, all over the States. It was really a privilege to go through a lot of these uh, stories because some of them are very touching. As a young girl, she was, her life was full of emotional and physical abuse, and the rave scene was one of the things that really helped heal her and get her back on a more even keel. There's a, one story about this a Chicano DJ and producer who was basically saved from the clutches of gang life by the rave scene. I mean, he had a lot of his gang homies, you know, die while he was getting into the rave scene, and he knew that if he'd gotten into that lifestyle, he would have ended up like them. There's a, one story, it's called Parents Who Plur. It's about a, a husband and wife who most of the year, you know, are perfectly, quote-unquote, respectable, you know, members of society. The husband, he's a uh, ex IT executive at a bank in his hometown. The woman is a stay-at-home mom. They have a seven-year-old autistic kid. And about twice a year, they go out to festivals and just go nuts. <laughs> you know, they just let it all completely hang out. There's one story in particular for me that really stands out. It's a, kind of a mixing of the old school and EDM. What it is, it's a story from a woman in the Pacific Northwest named Margaret, who is currently 56 years old, and she basically first got involved with the rave scene at age 48. She's always been a huge fan of dance music back to the 70s, and she was an early adoptee of uh, electronic music, but she never knew about raves or anything like that until she got into her mid-40s. And uh, she ended up catching quite a bit of heat from some members of her family, you know, for uh, going into this, you know, dastardly rave thing, you know. But uh, when she went to her first party, she was just completely uh, overwhelmed in the best possible way. She knew at that point that she was going to get much more involved in it. And uh, for someone at that age, the juxtaposition of someone, you know, in their late 40s, early 50s, getting into electronic music during the EDM wave. It's a its a very weird sort of thing, but it's also a very positive thing. I actually have a story about that party in uh, the Raver Stories Project. Um, what a lot of people don't know about that party is that a huge sandstorm came blasting through there at about midnight and sent almost everybody scurrying for their tents. Didn't Christopher Lawrence have a stack of quarters on his tone arm to keep the needle down he on the record? He did. Uh, what happened was um, the wind from that sandstorm was just whipping up everything and the turntable arms were being blown all over the place, you know. And So what they ended up doing was they ta uh, taped stacks of quarters to the end of the turntable arms to weigh the needles down to keep the needle on the record. The problem was is that that night Christopher was spinning mostly with acetates, not regular vinyl, acetates, which is softer. And so the combined weight of all those quarters and the needle and all the sand that was in there 
there, just totally grooved out a whole bunch of Christopher's records that day. He took a huge hit for the team. I mean, we even had a party at the Federal Building. Yeah, it was several. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved those parties because uh, these parties were held at the Federal Building in Westwood in Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard, which is a major artery, you know, going through that part of the city. I mean, these parties were uh, usually protests against things like the Rave Act and stuff like that. And they would usually have about, about 1,500 to 2,000 people would show up and inevitably a lot of them would spill out onto the sidewalks and people driving by in Wilshire Boulevard would just be staring at it going, what the hell is going on here? I mean, one of my favorite shots in Dance for Thunderstorm is a guy, a raver kid, in his Jenkos and, you know, dressed to the nines in rave gear, and he's uh, holding up a great big sign that says, Dancing is not a crime. And I thought, that's perfect. I mean, that just sums it up right there. That, you know, that one kid, that one shot, you know, that was it. Being able to collaborate with these people, and, and that's what it really was. It was more than just editing. It really was collaborating being able to tell their stories and keep it in their voice. That was one thing I was very conscious of. I did not want this to be my interpretation of their stories, which is why I left a bunch of these stories. You know, the grammar isn't the best, you know, in there. That didn't matter very much to me. What mattered was that the points were made clear and the story came across so that people could understand it 